else. So now that we have a failed motion, um, do we have uh, a desire to uh, bring this back at the next council meeting? Would anyone like to make a motion? Mr. Chairman, well, I can find my agenda here. I would move that we repeat this item on the January 13th agenda. I would also move that at that agenda we bring back item number 97, which was the proposed abandonment of the Shore Road shoulder improvements to the January meeting. That was postponed until this evening. I think we need to move that along to the next agenda also. Okay, the town clerk understands it'd be a kind of a double agenda item there. Okay. I hear a motion. Right. Um, second, um, unless Council McLaughlin would like to include, make sure that we also have information on the fire engine to consider the schedule for Okay, that will make it a triple motion a then. Motion. We will. I think no, is that that's acceptable fine. to mm -hmm. uh, Council McLaughlin? Okay, we'll and that would that, next month. that would include the update on the uh, circumstances with our ladder truck. So essentially, this motion uh, would, uh, for all uh, effect, table it tonight. We'll bring it up again on January 13th in the context of the new ladder truck, having more information at our disposal from the point of view of what will indeed specifically happen with uh, revenue sharing. Is that understood? That would be the motion. Council McLaughlin. I'm going to take this opportunity to speak to the Shore Road Shoulder Improvements. I also just this evening received a copy of the letter from Ann Van Lockheis, and very often information like this tends to get out into the public. There is some misinformation in here that I want to address as quickly as I can. It talks about her understanding is that the Shore Road Shoulder Improvement Project is proposing to cut down and eliminate the beautiful line of spruces and several other trees along Shore Road and her property line. For anybody who's not familiar with that section of Shore Road, it's the top of the hill before you go down to the old entrance of Fort Williams where those beautiful spruce trees are. There's a new home going in as you headed towards Portland. It's in on your left. That was not part of the proposal and I do not want it thought by anybody that those spruce trees are going to be cut down with the Shore Road shoulder improvements. If we abandon this project, it can come back as a council-approved project in the future. And at that time, I am sure the same criteria will hold that those spruce trees will not be slated for elimination. But they were not slated for elimination in the current proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McLaughlin. We do have a motion, and we do have a second. Is there uh, further discussion on this motion? Would the town clerk just read it? Because it is, uh, it's got a tripartite uh, story to it. It was moved and seconded to repeat the status of the FY92 budget at the January 13, 1992 town council meeting, included, including the proposed abandonment of the Shore Road shoulder improvement and update on the ladder track. I like the motion that we started out so I could vote against it. But you added the ladder truck in there, which I'm in favor of getting it out. So I guess, in all due respect to the final back, I'm still going to vote against the motion because I think we should bite the bullet and do something. Further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Yes. I asked a month ago why we uh, delayed on these things. I'm going to ask it again tonight. Uh, I think we owe it to the citizens, to all the departments, to do something. And if our town manager tells us that we're going to be $100,000 in the hole anyway, and another 100000 of these cuts, that, sure they hurt, but they're not going to hurt the department so that they're not operating departments. Every one of you is going to operate good. I know most of you, and I'm sure of it. <coughs> and I think that we should start off by letting the residents of Cape Elizabeth know that we're taking a $200,000 bite, so I'll vote against this amendment, too, on this motion. I hate, I hate delays. 
Council McLaughlin. I know as well as anybody in this room what it feels like to live under the budget cloud. I too have been jerked around <laughs> and in that gray limbo area and I know how horrible it is. But I very sincerely feel that action on this tonight may not result in the best interests. I want to know a more definite number that we're aiming for to make sure that I as a counselor am voting for the best cuts that I can. That's why I'm going to support it. Councilor uh, Cogsell. I too am going to support this motion because I feel if it's not necessary to cut the $200,000 out of the budget, I would like to see more money left in the uh, road maintenance budget before things get worse. And when I have more definite information, then I can vote. Uh, Councilor McLaughlin. If this motion fails, we're going to have to find another time to deal with the cuts besides next month. Yes, I would agree that, that we would have to perhaps uh, possibly uh, suggest a third motion uh, to, to make the cuts pending uh, a loss of uh, revenue sharing as uh, predicted by our town manager. That might, might have to go to that if it's another tie vote. I, I do intend to vote for the motion myself. I, I think that certainly um, I have no hesitation whatsoever uh, in making the cuts. Um, I would like to see specific numbers so I don't have to, uh, I guess, dis de appropriate or something? Uh, de appropriate. De appropriate from the uh, already uh, sums we have in front of us. Uh, Councilor Pearson. <coughs> yes, uh, Chairman Kerwin. Uh, I was going to say, so it's my understanding that a tie vote fails anyways and we have to have another one. Mm -hmm. uh, motion uh, made uh, because I'm going to vote against this and probably will follow up with a motion recommending that cuts be made contingent on further information. But at least we know what's being cut. If we do not have to cut that deep, then we can <coughs> reprioritize. Re How's that? Reappropriate. No, no, I want to reprioritize. Prioritize. But I want to reprioritize uh, those cuts into the avenues and the areas where they might be best used and not so hurt certain areas where they could be needed. How's that? Move the question. Yes. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Okay. We have a 3-3 three, three vote. The motion fails. Would anyone like to offer a third motion this evening on this item? Councilor Pearson. Yes, Councilor Coleman. I would move that the uh, proposed budget reductions be uh, passed as, uh, well, as proposed, uh, contingent on the outcome of the actual uh, numbers uh, reflected by the, I'm I, I see the confusion over there, so, uh, okay. <laughs> W would you like to repeat the motion that you were going to make as a third motion, Councilor Kerman? I think that a third motion could be this evening that we would vote uh, to adopt these cuts pending the revenue sharing that we are expecting to lose, indeed we lose. And that the motion would also um, then not address the fire truck. It would not uh, really address specifically the uh, roadway, uh, shore road, roadway drainage account because that would be lopped off here and now as in one full swoop and, and we wouldn't have an opportunity then to re-look at that um, given the uh, monies that we would be uh, losing from the state. That, that's how I would understand a third motion. Is that it sounded a long-winded, but <laughs> thank you, thank you. Would you have the clerk repeat that? <laughs> 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 
Thank you so much. Sure. I'm going to I'm going to uh, defer to the town manager and have him help us with this motion as it's become complicated. One side tells me I should sit back and relax and not get involved, but the other side tells me I ought to step in. What I would suggest you do is to to uh, make all of these reductions. Uh, should I, I would also suggest that you ask me after the first six months of the fiscal year, which will be December 31st, to relook at all of the revenues, to do totally new projections, to include within that ultimately what the state uh, does. Uh, hopefully, we sh should know by then or soon thereafter, and report back to you in January of where all the where all the revenues stand, and it should uh, and report to you as well on the fire truck and should uh, all of these cuts not have been necessary that the council would then have the option if it so chose to d chose to do so to reinstate something or to or to to whatever but in the meantime you make these cuts and everyone knows what they are and uh, in the end to relook at the revenues and if you want to put something back you'd, you could do it if you didn't want to you didn't have to so moved second Councilor Cogsell. Point of clarification addressed to the manager. At one point you told us that designated funds had to be abandoned in order to be used for something else or just to continue. That's what the charter reads. Then you need to officially abandon the Shore Road um, um, shoulder improvement fund in order to do this correctly. Yes, that's the intake and unnecessary action portion of the item. Okay, so we can't completely eliminate that tonight if we're going to approve these cuts. Is you that can correct? do that. That's my point. You can do that. We will do it if, if it votes in the affirmative. Okay. Councilor McLaughlin. Help me understand how much more we're going to know from the state by the end of December, which is what I think I just heard the manager saying. My understanding was that might, there might be no action until legislature goes back into session January 8th. Yeah. What, I, what, I, what I'm saying is, as of December 31st, I would look at all of our revenues. Which I'm saying you may not know what the state revenue is going to be. That's the only one we may not know, but I would hope we might know that more closely by January 13th. But we'd know everything else uh, by uh, the 1st or 2nd of January. Although, you know, if we don't know by January 13th, you know, we're going to find, you're going to find yourself in the same situation next month anyway. So, you know, I, uh, you know, I didn't disagree with making these cuts this evening, and I just disagreed with uh, uh, the description of them. I, but I didn't disagree with making the cuts. Oh, you didn't? No. Oh, sorry. I, I just, I just didn't like the... The reference the that they you weren't like the motion. Well, I didn't like the <laughs> reference that they weren't painful and that they weren't going to hurt because I think they are. But well, uh, but I, I I still think we I agree with you. We need to bite the bullet. Any any buck is painful if you take it out of your pocket and lose it. Give it to somebody else. You girls make the motion. The, the motion because you didn't like my motion. No, so there's a motion. Way. There is a motion. <laughs> the. Uh, the town manager suggested it. It's been moved. It's been seconded. Are there, is there any further discussion on the motion? <coughs> Move the question. All those Thank in favor you. of the motion, raise your right hand, please. Four to two. The motion carries. I'm sorry. Uh, negative votes, please. Are you putting your hand up? There are, there are two negative votes. Excuse me. Uh, four to two. The motion does fail. No, I'm sorry, the motion passed. I knew your heart I'm definitely, uh, no, I wanted to vote on that. I'm sorry. I was completely clear in how I voted. All right, we're going to go to item number 102. Um, perhaps we will take about a uh, three-minute break to re regather our sensibilities here and take uh, any necessary action. You have before you this evening, fellow councillors, a draft <coughs> entitled Cape Elizabeth Town Council Statement on the 1992 County Budget. This draft is uh, a seven paragraph <coughs> statement that uh, I asked the town manager 
with input from myself to to draft in response to a resolution that was sent to us by the uh, Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee. Uh, that resolution, as you have before you, is entitled Resolution on Proposed 1992 Cumberland County Budget. And essentially the, the, uh, the resolution asked us as a municipality to uh, affix our names to basically endorsing the recommendations of the Cumberland <coughs> County Budget Advisory Committee for our fiscal year 1992, also of which you have before you, approximately 10 resolutions. I attended the hearing today in uh, the, the probate uh, court building in downtown Portland, and there certainly was a, a far greater uh, representation of citizens this year than there were last year. I would suspect last year there was about 12 people that attended the second public hearing. This year I would estimate 150, maybe 200 people such that the hearing was moved to the uh, Superior Court uh, room and it was literally a standing room only uh, crowd. I would, uh, I'm extrapolating as both Chairman of the Council, but also a member of the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee, to suggest that probably 90% of the individuals in attendance this afternoon were attending as a consequence of the recommended uh, human services cutback and grants. But human services in particular seem to receive the most uh, input. Historically, what happened with the recommendations that the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee made uh, were that essentially none of us attended 100% of the meetings. Uh, many of us attended the majority of the meetings, but none of us, with the exception, I believe, of uh, Mr. Dick Sanborn, who chaired the group, attended absolutely every one of the meetings. Um, I, unfortunately, did not attend the, the, the final meeting where the recommended human services budget uh, cut was, uh, was uh, so to speak, put into stone here. And I dissented personally from the, um, from the awesome degree of this particular cut. Um, personally, I don't feel that the, that the county uh, ought to be funding human services. And I think that over time, there should be greater dialogue between the municipalities and the county to try to pare down a budget that has gone from $2 million to over $10 million in the span of about eight years. The, the, the county budget has just ballooned in exponential fashion. And somebody somewhere has to take a stand. And I think this year it was a gutsy move by the, the Budget Advisory Committee to, to make this stand. But I also think it was too radical from the point of view of cutting back on agencies that derive a grand majority of their funding uh, from county allotments. Uh, I had extensive conversations with the representative uh, Cushman Anthony, uh, chairing the human services uh, group for the county, uh, Chris Irvin representing Cape Elizabeth. I also spoke with at some length and also a town manager who chaired this group before Cush Anthony took over. And I could not support the human services uh, or grants recommendation uh, in that they would be eliminated entirely as of July 1st, 1992. What I did do personally at this particular hearing was to read to the group the proposed uh, resolution that we are going to deal with tonight here uh, during our meeting, and I wish I could find it. Oh, here it is. <laughs> um, and that is indeed the draft that you have before you. Um, essentially, this draft urges the county commissioners to be extremely fiscally conservative as the county moves toward adoption of an annual budget. It secondly concurs with the Budget Advisory Committee that any salary or wage adjustments at the county level should be at the absolute minimum and that all staffing levels should be reviewed 
and vacancies should be left open whenever possible. Thirdly, capital items should be deferred except for those purchases which would replace equipment and vehicles with no useful remaining life. Fourthly, and the most controversial of the uh, recommendations, would be that the human services and grants budget should be reduced 20 percent with the cuts coming from areas of lower priority instead of across the board cuts. This would involve <coughs> collaboration between the appropriate individuals where their agencies are affected in conjunction with the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee and the commissioners to arrive at that 20 percent rather than it being just across the board lopping off of funding. Fifthly, that if a state should eliminate or suspend the municipal sharing, uh, revenue sharing program, that the county budget should be at a level 10 percent below that of a year ago. And if funding for municipal revenue sharing is fully restored, then the county budget should still have no increase in the total amount from municipal assessments, uh, as other municipal revenues other than revenue sharing are also declining precipitously. A uh, compromise at the state level should be proportionately implemented at the county local level. The sixth item was that the county should explore privatization of the Civic Center and of the county jail. The patrol portion of the sheriff's budget should be borne by those communities receiving direct benefits with this suggestion to be implemented over several years beginning this year. And seventh, the three county commissioners should work actively this coming year with municipal officials to develop a new county budget process that would provide for a more meaningful role for municipal officials. Now, I took this action uh, to ask the town manager to draft this um, resolution in lieu of the resolution that the, that, that the county budget advisory committee sent to all of you, of which uh, I am a member. So in essence, we have before us two resolutions. And uh, I don't know for a fact what municipalities have adopted the resolution as sent to us from the Budget Advisory Committee, or which municipalities have drafted their own resolution that might have taken uh, segments of that uh, proposed resolution but deleted other segments. So I think, <laughs> like all of the issues this evening, we have not many options. We can adopt the, or we can adopt or not adopt the resolution that the County Budget Advisory Committee sent to all of us. Or we could adopt the draft that I have asked our town manager to put together for our consideration. Uh, or we could create an entirely new resolution among these uh, six minds tonight. So that is the, that is the story where we're at. Um, I would only conclude my remarks by saying that I had to leave the, um, the public hearing this evening to uh, prepare for our council uh, meeting this evening. So I did not stay for its entirety. Um, there was, I, could, I can honestly say that there was a, the majority of people speaking were um, in absolute disagreement for the grants and the human services cuts. They, in general, wanted them restored. There was a minority of individuals who felt very fiscally conservative that uh, the Budget Advisory Commission recommendations ought to be adopted by the commissioners. I did not have an opportunity to hear the summary remarks of the three commissioners that I suspect may not have been made yet if the, if the group was still there and everyone spoke who wanted to speak. But I would only say that, again, to underscore the issue, uh, county government is, is growing at an exponential allotment year after year. It continues to take on more and more uh, funding of items and departments and events. And I just think that the uh, proposal going into this evening's second public hearing of an increase of 7.68 percent is, is absolutely unacceptable in this fiscal climate. And as of the meeting that I attended, no cuts had been made uh, cutting back on that figure yet. The commissioners have until midnight, December 15th, to adopt the 1992 fiscal budget. For all intents and purposes, I suspect that means uh, Friday night uh, at the end of the business day, they'll probably be making final recommendations. But I think it's very important that we in Cape Elizabeth send to them some statement, be it a combination of the two or either or, a strong statement that we are unhappy with the way the county government is just ballooning 
uh, more and more out of control each year. That concludes my remarks, and I'll open it up for discussion. I should also say that uh, our town manager did uh, attend this uh, budget hearing uh, with me this afternoon. Councilor Jordan. I'll kick it off. <clears throat> I, I cannot uh, sign this draft as it is put forward tonight because I am against the cuts as far as human services and the grant budgets. And also, <clears throat> I'm against that 10% level that you're speaking of because <clears throat> I think that you've got to realize that all their increases isn't, and I think you realize, isn't in uh, the uh, human services area. That a lot of their increases in their budget in years past when I was on the committee was mandates from the state correctional committee and what they should do and how they should care for prisoners and and it would increase their budget substantially in a couple of different years. I'm in favor of the uh, capital items. I'm in favor of the, the salary deal. I'm in favor of the, as uh, far as the Sheriff's Department, the uh, billing these other communities that use them. And that has been, was recommended when I was there. It's been recommended for about four years that I know of. And I think it was recommended even previous to that. As far as the grants go, I'm very disappointed that, and I don't think they realize, one of the grants would be the Cumberland County Extension. And I don't think that a lot of you realize how much the extension does for, for different communities in Cumberland County. And in fact, I have a letter here from the president of the Cumberland County Extension Association. And if you may, I'd like to read one paragraph. The, the advisory committee report recommends elimination of all grant accounts because these appropriations do not constitute a appro appropriate use of tax revenue at the county level. With all due respect to members of the advisory committee, I submit that partial funding of corporate extension by county government is appropriate and is in consent with County Extension Act uh, 7 MRSA PP 191-195. In that statute, the main legislature stated that County Extension is viewed as a unique and important educational program of county government, 7 MRSA P 193. That's part of the letter, and I also got here, there's 50 57,132 people that were served by the extension in 1991. Cape Elizabeth had 1,292. I'll just read a few of them. Cumberland, 3516. Portland, 8,200. South Portland, 6,400. Town of Gorham, 6,800. That's just a few of them. There's some 23, 22, and what have you. And here are just some of the programs that the extension do, the 4-H, school age, child care education. I won't read the details that go with them, I'll just read the highlight. South Poland School Age and Child Care Task Force, Child Care Providers, Water Quality, Master Com the Master Composition and Control Pollution, Waste Away, Forestry, <coughs> Small Business Education, production, home gardening and master gardening, expanded food nutrition education program, nutrition, community health, family community leadership, lakes and hills leadership programs. These are just some of the things that they do and I can't understand why in this day and age that they would recommend doing away with those grants because I feel they do help a lot of individuals, young and old. And I would like to add also, it disturbs me that in this day and age and way the economy is, that they want to start picking on the people that need some help, that's lost their job, and maybe they would have to go there and get some help. And I don't think it's a proper way to cut their budget. So these 
other individuals that might need some help would have to be left out because they're not on the list. Maybe they could work it around. And uh, as far as the uh, Civic Center, I don't know who would want it, but if they want to look into the privatization of it, I was there when it was built, and it started out real good, and you've got to think of the economy, and you've got to think of uh, the C-SPAN down to Old Archer that took a lot of their shows away from them because it was a little larger and what have you, and that's where they made their money on the rock shows. And so therefore, I could not put my signature on this document as printed. Who else would like to uh, offer some input? Councilman McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Question to the manager. What kind of use, if any, does this community make of the county sheriff? The, the primary use is that uh, the county sheriff provides the jail. Uh, the, 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 the sheriff's department is essentially divided into two <coughs> major divisions. One is the patrol division and the other is the jail division. We do use the jail. We do not in any way, shape, or manner use directly as a, commu as a community uh, the uh, sheriff's patrol division except you know that you know they may intercept someone in the community where they patrol that's either a resident of Cape Elizabeth or that may later visit Cape Elizabeth uh, and we, you know we have residents that drive through those communities uh, and you know indirectly but directly we receive no benefit is there any worst case scenario under which we would make more use or a different use of the sheriff's patrol division if you eliminated the police department or if they all went on strike would we you would we have access to the Sheriff's Patrol Division? They do not have the right to strike. If they all didn't show up for work someday, could we call on the Sheriff's Patrol Division? That would be the last day that they wouldn't show up for work. <laughs> it's so hard to get an answer sometimes. Yes, we could, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to make very clear I, I wouldn't... I appreciate you know, what you're I, saying. Those are all hypotheticals that uh, I would not tolerate. I would share your distress and you're in a position where you don't tolerate that. I share Councillor Jordan's concerns about the language in here reducing the cuts to human services and grants. I'm always concerned at our municipal budget time that we are being asked to appropriate funds for some of these same agencies that are funded through the county budget. That's a double hit in a lot of ways that I'm not sure everybody's aware of that, that happens. I don't like that scenario, but I disagree with Councillor Creelman in that I think in many instances it's much more appropriate to do the funding for these agencies and these grants at the county level rather than at the municipal level because a lot of them that serve Cape Elizabeth residents serve residents throughout the county and therefore I think it follows that the funding should be at a broader level. One grant area that I'm a bit familiar with is the Portland Public Library, which is a regional facility. In my six years as a library trustee, I became quite well aware of how valuable that facility is to all of our citizens. And I would be most distressed to see them having to cut back in the services they provide to us, such as, you know, you can request a book. If, Cape, if Thomas Memorial Library doesn't have the book, they do a search, and that search is done through Portland Public, and they can get the book for you from Alaska, if that's the only place it is. If we cut some of this funding to Portland Public, you might not be able to get that book. And I don't think we should have to live with that kind of situation because of the proposed cuts in the count, the proposed cut as it's drafted in this language. That's why I couldn't support that part of it. The salary and wage adjustments, the capital items, I have no problem with. The privatization of the Civic Center, there might be a former, like, former Cape Counselor who'd like to take that on, who knows. Um, privatization of the county jail. I, I think the privatization is always something that's worth looking into. I don't have a problem with signing something like that. And I think your last paragraph here is absolutely marvelous that 
the Commission should work more actively in the coming year, in all coming years, with the municipal officials. I think this kind of document is much more effective than the one that was sent out to us from, who, who was this sent out from? The committee. From the, from the advisory committee. I think being much more specific as the proposed language here is, is makes it a more effective document, but I am not able to go along with a proposed 20% cut in human services and grants. Well, just a clarification, the, the resolution sent out from the advisory committee is extremely specific. Basically, it mm -hmm. says we endorse everything that the other document suggested. That, okay. That's what it's asking for, signatures. And I, I'm in agreement that that's extreme, that that, that, that is, uh, per my personal opinion, is that that would be much, much too extreme to just eliminate all human services forever and ever, hallelujah, that that's not going to work. Um, I'm just wondering if I can possibly get a sense from the council that if we eliminated paragraph four, if, if we simply eliminated paragraph four in the draft that we have before us, uh, item number 102, if the remaining draft would be acceptable to enough of the councilors so that we could at least pass a draft to send to the county commissioners to let them know we're concerned. I would just, I'd hate to end up with a tabling or nothing happening from all of this work and the county commissioners would have only received the input of one town councilor in Cape Elizabeth when we have an opportunity to, to make a strong statement if we could all agree on six out of seven or even five out of seven <coughs> if anyone had strong objections about another one of the paragraphs. Councilor Pearson. Yes, uh, Chairman Croman. I think that I'd be much more comfortable if you just eliminated both of the percentages in there. Uh, because although human services, the grants budget does have a, a great uh, impact on many residents of Cumberland County, whatever town they may come from, uh, the big picture is we're all in the same same boat and I think a lot of people fail to realize that because they don't get a direct benefit from a certain thing that it why fund it uh, yet on the other hand you don't want to see too many do uh, duplicative services that the state may have something that they're funding and then you've got a county that funds it then you've got a local government each time you have a, a different level of of the same type program you've also got an administrator for that program so you start building up too many chiefs and not enough engines. Uh, and, you know, I just think that, I mean, paragraph one and paragraph, the last paragraph are great. If you eliminate the two percentages, essentially you're just giving direction, you're making a strong statement, say here's the way it goes. And I think that just by eliminating 20% in the human services grants budget should be reduced, I mean, it's specifically says with uh, areas of lower priority instead of across the board cuts. Mm -hmm. I think any cut should be prudently made uh, without giving any percentages or any direction. And people can't figure out that these are tough times and they better, you know, look at where they're spending. And that position is eliminated and they won't have a say in it at all. So that's my feeling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Jordan. I would just like to add something that you spoke about uh, a minute ago, Councilor Creeman, is that to send these people back to the communities, that was done years ago. They used to come in here and each one of those human services group had 20 minutes, 15 minutes or what have you, to state their case and the town would decide how much they would give them. And it was thought at the, at the time that they would go to the county and just have one place that they had to go to plead their case to get their funds and then the communities would uh, appropriate the money to do it that way. Now the ones that come out and try to get what I would call double dipping, uh, we don't have to fund them. They can ask and you can refuse them and just say, well, go to the county, that's where our money is. But if they want to take the shot and come in and, and plead the case and find uh, six or seven soft hearts, let them do it. But uh, I, I still think it's a one spot is where they should go. And it, to me, it makes good sense. And it goes along a little bit what Council uh, Pearson had to say just a minute ago. 
and uh, I'm kind of in agreement with what he said as far as eliminating four and doing away the percentages on number five or doing away with it all together, rewording it. So I don't know if you want to table in motion, work it out, or what do you want to do? Well, I think the issue is that if we table it, it's a useless endeavor because they vote uh, Friday, and I think that's really the issue. Can we come up with something this evening to send to the commissioners, or, or can't we? I think that's really the bottom line. Councillor Cogsell. I um, concur with Councillor um, Pearson's idea of eliminating the percentages, but I think we'll be sending them a message that they really do have to consider cuts and where you're emphasizing that areas of lower priority should be um, considered first is not really directing them to cut some of the more important services. Okay. And I think basically the whole, whole letter is very much to the point. So therefore, I move that we adopt the um, Cape Elizabeth version of the statement on the county budget with the elimination of the percentages in paragraph four and paragraph five. Second. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. <coughs> Is there further discussion? Clarification. If you, you're just going to take the 20% out of number four? Yes. And leave the rest of it in? Yes. And you're just going to take 10% out of number five? Yes. And leave the rest in? Right. So the human services grant budget should be reduced without the 20% mm -hmm. with cuts coming from the lower priorities instead of across the board type cuts. Right. Yes, that could mean anywhere from a dollar to, you know, 356000 depending on what the commissioners decide. I think what we must also remember is that um, we, as the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee, um, have made recommendations to the county commissioners. Um, although this has uh, created a lot of controversy, and it has certainly uh, raised the issue in terms of uh, public consciousness, the uh, committee in and of itself is completely impotent from the point of view of decision making. We, we simply are making a recommendation. The commissioners dutifully have listened to us. They have listened to all the public comment. They have a complete liberty to reject any and all uh, recommendations that we've made. That's entirely up to the discretion of the commissioners in Cumberland County. It's not like that in all of the counties in Maine, but in Cumberland County it is. So I just want to emphasize that, that um, I, can live, I can live a lot easier with sending this document, having taking, taking out the percentages, which clearly weakens the document, no question about it from my perspective, but at the same time I think anything is better than nothing to make a statement. The recommendations, if I may, Mr. Chairman, wasn't a hundred percent the ones present, I believe, was four to two votes, and uh, one of them that wasn't present sent in uh, minor minority report, as they put it. Yeah, uh, it was a four to two on the extension grants, and it yeah. was a five to one on the human services. Yeah. And there are nine members on the committee. Those were the ones that voted. Others were polled, but did not officially vote. That's right. Yes. And one of them sent in their, their answer as far as it goes. That's right. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. So, so there was no unanimous uh, okay. vote on either of those two issues. On the okay. other issues, there were uni unanimous. Okay. okay, I just wanted to get that out. Yes. Councilor McLaughlin. I have a problem with the potential interpretation of this if we eliminate the 20% from the fourth paragraph, that it could be interpreted to totally cut that part of the budget, and I can't support that. Is it reduced, not cut? It, well, yeah. I think it could be interpreted to totally reduce to zero. Council, Councilor Cox. I move the question. Question has been moved. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Four. All those opposed? The motion carries four to two. Thank you very much. We'll have the we'll direct the um, town clerk to modify this particular document.
uh, and with, I guess we would then affix it with the signatures that voted for the motion and delete the, sig and delete the signatures who voted in the negative and send it off to the commissioners. I We'd probably send it without signatures and indicating what the vote was, uh, rather than asking everyone to come in and sign because of the tightness of the schedule. Is that acceptable? We Maybe have a document here for signatures, and I would think the ones that voted in favor of it would put their signature on it. This would be my feeling. If, if I voted in favor, it, I'd be willing to put my name on it. Yeah, I have no if that's what they are. I have if no I, question. I, where I didn't, I'm not going to put my name on it. I just thought uh, leaving it blank with your name on it isn't fair to you. Why is it? Because I wasn't in favor of it. Right. So you, we, you prefer to leave it blank? Your My name, name Your yes. name typed in, but just blank, not that, signed? That is correct. Yeah. What do you feel, Councilor McLaughlin? I don't have a problem with that. I'm not sure that's the best way to do it. If it's done that way, I would hope that there would be an explanation along with the vote. You know, I stated why I wasn't in favor of it, because I don't want the potential cut to zero. I think, you know, you can use this document and just white out the percentages if you're concerned with it. the whiteout looks fairly efficient. Well, we are going to send the document with those percentages whited out. Mm -hmm. that, that was the motion. If I, if I may, would, what I would suggest is, uh, you know, it, it, it's difficult to track you folks down during the week, particularly when we have a tight schedule with, with all of your busy schedules. Uh, what I would suggest is, is we do a new document with the changes you've made that we put at the bottom, adopted by a four to two vote of the town council, listing those members in favor, yeah. those members opposed, and the member who was absent. That's that. Is that That's acceptable fine. to everyone? So be it. A tested copy. <laughs> That's right. That takes care of item number 102. Uh, item number 103 is to consider setting a public hearing on sewer rates and take any necessary action, and I will defer to uh, Mr. McGovern. It's a painful evening. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the earlier discussion was one that affected individual departments and with reduction in services. Uh, with sewer rates, it's not so easy. Uh, whenever you look at cost, you look at uh, uh, budgets, you look, uh, you know, at possibly reducing expenses, you also look at raising revenues. You know, we, in all the budget discussion we just had, uh, you know, no one was proposing to raise any fees in order to, to help meet uh, the balance. Uh, unfortunately, we're not in the, I, I don't think we're in the same position with the sewer fund. As uh, you look at the budget for the sewer fund, uh, the current year is, is around 1.32 million. Uh, with the water district assessment, as we now know it for the coming year, it'll be 1.38 million. Uh, unfortunately, when you look at that budget, uh, of the 1.38 million, 1.33 million of that is totally fixed. Uh, those are the components of debt service, and which is $376,000, and the Portland Water District assessment, which is pr projected $965,000. Uh, as the council is aware, and perhaps the public is not, last year we had an operating deficit in the sewer fund of $136,000. Uh, this year we have a projected deficit of $80,750. When the budget was prepared, uh, the, the actual deficit is, is now greater than that uh, because uh, the water district assessment is coming in over budget. Uh, the bottom line in the... Uh, I'm really hesitant to say what it is. Uh, nonetheless, is a 15% increase uh, recommended in uh, regular sewer rates. Uh, you know, th this is, is extremely difficult for me to do. I, you know, I recognize uh, the burden. This is going to be particularly on the larger families, uh, as well as the people on fixed incomes. Uh, unfortunately, we're on fixed expenditures here. And uh, I think it uh, would be fiscally imprudent, if not reckless, uh, 
not to have a projected revenue stream which funds the expenditures. We can't continue to operate at, at a deficit. We're not, we're not uh, the federal government. Uh, you know, I think, you know, the citizens as much as, you know, they'll, when they hear about this will be very unhappy with it. I still think nonetheless they would agree that the town needs to pay its bills. Uh, what I uh, would like to mention is uh, that uh, the Portland Water District assessment still has not been finally confirmed, although it, it, it will be probably within the next week or so uh, by the trustees. I did have a, a meeting last week that uh, apparently they, they're getting somewhat of a message from us because uh, on the annual assessment I met with them and on the representing the water district was not only uh, Doug Stewart, who's the controller, and Steve Gordon, the operations man who, manager who usually come, but Jim Jordan, our trustee, and Joe Taylor, the general manager of the district, also came in. And they were fairly responsive to the questions. And I, at this point, I received a draft of it, and uh, I did show Joe Taylor this particular report that was given to the council. And he was very agreeable to attending the public hearing next month to answer not only the council's questions but the public's questions on exactly you know what what is causing the increase uh, in the water district assessment or the very high level of it, uh, but uh, this this is this is very difficult. But uh, I I professionally I can do nothing else but recommend uh, that you set a public hearing that uh, would effectively raise the rates 15 percent. Thank you, Michael. Any discussion? Councilor Pearson. Question, if I may, uh, perhaps to the town manager, Council Crum. Uh, the water district assessment includes what? Uh, thank you. That pays for the debt service and the operation and maintenance of the Southern Cape Elizabeth treatment plant on Spurwick Avenue. It pays for the amount that South Portland bills the water district, who then bill us, for all of the waste that goes into the South Portland treatment plant, plus the cost of sludge disposal from both plants, uh, plus the cost of the interceptor lines uh, throughout the community, and the operation and maintenance of all of the pump stations. Does that also include the actual water that is used? This is sewer. This is no. This is it has. It's not directly tied to uh, water. This is the sewer side. I'm not sure I understood your question. Well, no. I. I this is their assessment of what what they think they're going to treat, and what their fixed costs already are for right. debt services, which that debt service is separate from the other debt service, which is held That's out local separate debt here. Service, yeah. Okay, and that takes care of our Southern Cape system, correct? The the and improvements to the local debt service. Yes, that's Broad Cove. And the local debt service counts uh, covers the local share of the treatment plant. This is there was a small portion of that, plus primarily sewer lines, the collector lines that have been placed throughout the community, uh, with a sewer note that was in 1974, uh, another note in uh, 78, and two notes in 1986. And just, uh, the, the, whole, the whole issue, having, having been on the Board of Sewer Appeals and then seeing this assessment continually go up and in conversations with the Portland Water District as far as uh, wouldn't it be who the, the residents or, or make mandatory for building permit activity, et cetera, to implement conservation measures. And the response I got from the Portland Water District was, why conserve a resource that we can pump out at three or four times the capacity now? Which is, to me, a crude mentality that he might have there. Uh, so in other words, and, and it's further, a slap in the face further down here that uh, we could lose revenues because of conservation. So if people did their best to conserve water, we wouldn't have as much effluent uh, to be billed, yet it's still going to cost us more, which right. to me is, is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, and, and I would think with that type of assessment, with that kind of money being paid to the Portland Water District, 
that we better get rebuilt sewer lines to reduce infiltration, which is a, a large portion of the uh, flow capacity that's, that, that we're built for. Of the entire budget of nine hundred and sixty five thousand uh, dollars, fifty eight thousand is set aside for uh, I and I reduction. And the project the water districts particularly looking at is down on Ottawa Road, which is on the South Fulton Cape Elizabeth line down on the shore. And uh, that's the only I, I wouldn't call it a combined sewer overflow, but it's uh, we have a real problem there that's taxing the, the pump station. Uh, so there are there are a slight amount of funds in there for reducing uh, uh, I&I's infiltration and inflow. Okay, it still doesn't make anything any easier to swallow, but I thank you. I will get you before next month copies of all the water district. Unfortunately, the only thing that gave me ran 60 pages. And what I asked them to do, and they said they could do, was cut and paste on their computer just the Cape Elizabeth sections. Oh. Uh, say, could I just ask one more thing of the town manager? I, I asked directly from the Port of War Portland Water District, but they never provided me the information. Do you, or could you get information that says how much water is actually billed to Cape Elizabeth residents? Yeah, we have that currently available. Okay, because I asked for that information just to find out what the actual numbers are so people can find out what's being used, what they are paying for on their water bill, and what we are paying for for disposal and treatment. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not sure with the computers whether or not they can isolate the water billing for those customers on sewer. Uh, they, they perhaps can, it might require some programming. But I, I do know we can get the water consumption for the entire community. Obviously, it costs roughly, I would guess, about three times more for treatment and disposal than it does for water itself. I think all you have to do is look at your individual bill and you can see what the difference is. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. Would this is more nice to the manager. Would your billing from the water company, do they indicate in the bill or do they know? Is there a breakdown of the cost as far as transporting the sludge and the treatment of the sludge over the cost of running the plant? It's a, at one time, Cape Lewis ran the plants and took care of them. I'm just wondering if they'd be any money. We thought it'd be a saving to turn it over the water company. I'm just wondering if there's any Senate to take a look at. Maybe we ought to take them back and whether we could have any saving because when you turn it over to the Pony Water District, uh, you don't have no control over uh, how they run the plant, the manpower, and so on and so forth. And I was just wondering if there's a, a breakdown in any way that we could figure out on the time spent as far as checking the plant, going over the plant, and uh, <coughs> less hauling the sludge away. And, they, they do break out in their budget the labor and overhead for the treatment plant, for the pump stations, for the general services, which, which are other odds and ends. I, I don't know if the sludge is there specifically, but I think they, they probably could do that. Uh, I did ask them uh, how come the two guys at the treatment plant couldn't maintain pump stations. Uh, they did say that uh, they're already maintaining the pump station across the street from the southern treatment plant. And uh, I said to Mr. Taylor that uh, you know I would expect a more fuller explanation than they were able to give me at that meeting, and uh, they did agree that they'd go back and check. There was it was also for the treatment plant account labor was up 10 percent, and uh, he did go back. And Steve Gordon, the operations manager, called me today and said they will be able to cut that back by a couple thousand. That uh, something was in there twice or whatever, uh, but you know 2,000 out of 965 is. It all helps, but um, so it's not what, change. what they had there then is turn in at the plant and just check on the old treatment plant, the pump station across the street. Yeah. And uh, any of the other pump stations would be done by other personnel. It, is that correct? The and they had two on duty at. The yeah, and I agree plant. with the principle that they need two on duty at the treatment plant. It's a it's a dangerous area over there, but uh, 
they don't have to be there all the time. Sometimes one of them could go check the you know, pump stations around and you know gear their work so that someone wasn't going down in the old wet well. wells or whatever you call them and all being all alone. I, I agree with those safety factors, but they're not down there all the time. And it's only uh, part of a day or a few hours a day that they're there. So it seems to one guy. I know they can go other places because I see the truck. And uh, I would just like to look at that. I don't know whether there could be any savings or not, but this, this bothers me, this water company and the increases, and you, you don't seem to have any handle. We can't get a handle on it. Any different than RWS. They feel there's a blank check out in these communities, and all they do is go ahead and do what they want to, and then just send the bill. And uh, I hope other communities will carry a message back to them saying, hey, we've got to do some thinking here and think of these communities and how it affect them. And I'm disturbed that I know you said a year ago we need a little increase. I, I fathomed it out. I got more than 15% when I had done my figures, but my arithmetic could have been wrong. Maybe I would have to get me a more modified calculator to come up with a better percentage than I did. But kind of an answer to what Council Pearson was saying is the only way you're going to help these people out, and we discussed it last year, in my opinion, and I know the growth is going on now, but the sewer element's going to be changed so you can allow other people on here and pick up some revenue. They know different than your business. You need more revenue every year, and this needs to pick up new revenue, or you're going to bankrupt these people that's on the sewer. Thank you. There are going to be times you think we're looking at each other's notes down here when we come to some I know you read mine. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Jordan has spoken very well to a lot of my concerns. One thing that I want to go back to what Councilor Pearson asked for and make sure I understand what he's trying to, what information he's trying to get, was for the water consumption for the entire town. Without the entire town being on sewer, I'm, I'm wondering if what you want is the water consumption of those households on sewer versus the entire town. Well, I was told by the water district I can get total and then broken down with who they actually bill for sewer. Okay. And since they do our billing, they have that broken down. Okay. I and it can't be that hard in 3,500 residences to make that breakdown. Okay, I wasn't clear. I didn't understand you were asking me that distinction. Thank you. Mr. McGovern, you spoke of the report you had from the water district, that 60-page tome that I'm glad you did not give to us at this point. But I'm curious as to some sections in there regarding South Portland that may be pertinent to us. I'm wondering especially what impact the upgrade of the treatment plant in South Portland is going to have, if that's addressed in that document. I know that is planned. It's part of a legal situation that South Portland has found itself in, and I'm wondering what the impact of that, if that impact is figured in here, and if it's not, is that something we can expect down the road? Our status with the increase in capacity with the city of South Portland and the treatment plant uh, is not yet fully determined. I will assume that there is the potential for renegotiating our contract with South Portland. Any such yeah. renegotiation I would expect would be an additional increase in fees to Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, if we, see, we, we own a, a percentage of the treatment plant based on the percentage of flow we put into it. Uh, if they increase the size of the treatment plant, the, you know, the issue comes down, do we buy any more of that additional capacity? And uh, I had, when Joe Taylor met with me the other day, we, we had a brief discussion on that, but it wasn't at all conclusive. And, uh, you know, I think we said, well, we, ought, we all ought to get together again. And he indicated he had tried to reach the city manager of South Portland on several occasions, and he hadn't gotten back to him, obviously. He's South busy. Portland city manager is busy. I'm very pleased to hear that um, Mr. Taylor 
is able to be at our public if we set this to public hearing next month I think that will be very helpful for all of us I I think counselors still have questions to ask and I'm sure the citizens do but I you know this town took a very forward role in expressing its concern about proposed water rate increases I am equally distressed by seeing the Portland Water District assessment I'm distressed tonight to hear that it's coming in over budget for this current fiscal year we can't keep doing this to our citizens and no matter what the economic times are it, you know, it's difficult right now because of the economic times because it's more than a sluggish economy where I live I don't know about the rest of the people here even in the good times I think Councilor Jordan's issue of needing more customers on the sewer lines it's right on target so I think we've got more than one area we can address to try to alleviate the situation but if we're going to have a public hearing I just I can't accept without some really good documentation from the water district why we're seeing the increase from them that we are and I don't think our citizens can accept that you know, I, I, I would like to say that you know if you look at if you look at their assessment I, I hate to be defending the water district because my views on them are so well known but you know if you look at their assessment for this year count they do it on calendar year, on this calendar year versus calendar year 1992 their assessment is actually not up that you know it's not up the full 15% the problem is, is uh, we assumed it might go down because of a, some money they had there for a project last year. Uh, it didn't because they're continuing to carry the I and I money of fifty-eight thousand, which I, I think is a, a very important investment and one that you know just has to be done, uh, you know, over time. Uh, plus, uh, you know, the council made the five percent pledge last year, yeah. and when you made that five percent pledge. Uh, you know the sewer rate should have gone up 13 percent last year and they didn't uh, that's it uh, eight, they went up you know with the equivalent of like 50,000 there was a budgeted deficit of another 80,000 it's roughly you know uh, $10,000 to each percentage increase in uh, rates uh, you know it, it was underfunded for this year and we're, we're paying for it it's part of the problem because it has been underfunded for a number of years and the cumulative impact is hitting us that's right that, and that's it the numbers show that hundred thirty six thousand dollar deficit two years ago at least eighty thousand this year and I think uh, it's time to bite the bullet and uh, the we you know we had a surplus in this account it's it's uh, dwindling drastically and uh, we've got to to stem the tide and uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'll skip the cliches. Thank you. I was <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I know this is going to be set for public hearing and it's getting along late hour, uh, but I'd like to uh, pose a little information for the people out in, in TV land here, if I may. The Northern system hasn't did pretty well as far as increases in 87, 88, and 89 in 90 then all of a sudden it went from 255,600 to 398,400 and then 91 to 92 projected is 371,700 91 went up and 92 is going down I don't know are these concrete figures or are they something that uh, is could be adjusted or they, they could be adjusted slightly, but I, I don't anticipate major adjustments. Okay, and now the southern system, after it was put on the line, isn't in bad shape. I mean, what I mean by that, it's had its increases, but the first year was only a part of a year in 87 of 101,000. Then it went to 527, 410, 512, 525, 564, anticipated for 1992. So. Yes, it has increased, but one year it went down and what have you. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, just to throw out to the people that are listening, what is being proposed, and I think they might like to know before the next meeting, if, if it's okay to throw the figures out. 
But uh, it is proposed at $34.04 for the first four, uh, first 300 cubic feet of measured water usage from 2960. That's $4.44 increase a quarter. Is that correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, did I do my arithmetic right? Okay. And then down, the next one is $2.78 for each additional 100 cubic feet or fractions thereof of monthly meter water usage from $2.42, which is a 36 cent increase. Is that correct? And that amounts to about $1.44 a year on that one, and the other one is around $17.76 a year. Am I on target or am I way off? No, you're, no, you're low. Too low. I'm low. Exactly yeah, because we've gone from quarterly to monthly. These are monthly They're rates. Monthly. Oh, you've gone from quarterly monthly. to monthly. I didn't understand it that way. Yeah. Well, then, uh, no, it's about $60. $60. I thought it was up. still quarterly, so I no, will stand corrected. So we've got a $4.44 increase monthly times 12. Not, uh, times 12. Okay. It's interesting. It's almost as much as the $5 increase on the, on the water side. Yes. And I just thought the people might, might like to know, so I'll move that we set this for a public hearing on January the 13th, 1992 at 7.30 p.m. Town Hall. Okay. Further discussion? All those in favor? Vote is six to zero. Thank you very much. Item number 104 is to consider granting a quit claim deed for land and buildings at 24 Pilot Point Road and take any necessary action. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I finally have a little good news. Uh, property that we had foreclosed on earlier, which wish to pay their taxes, and uh, Debbie Pizzo is holding a check. There was a question as to who exactly the quit claim ought to be made out to. Uh, town attorneys looked into it, and what you have before you on the on the podium this evening is a proposed quick claim to Stephen B. Wyman, successor trustee of HM2 Realty Trust. Town attorney's office has fully looked into this, and I would recommend that this be uh, approved and you authorize me to sign the quick claim. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Vote is six to zero. Thank you very much. Item number 105 this evening is to consider amending the town council rules to provide that the town council chairman shall vote last when there is a roll call vote and take any necessary action. Uh, Councilor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I proposed this amendment when I became aware of what was happening in some of our roll call votes. I think it goes along with the responsibility of being chairman that when there is an instance of a roll call vote, that it be done in alphabetical order with the chairman being the final member to vote in all cases, not just to break a tie, because our chairman does vote in all cases. And I would recommend to the rest of the counselors that we adopt this amendment. Sir? We have a motion and we have a second. Is there any discussion? Councilor Pearson. Uh, yes, Councilor Herman. Uh, I had a couple questions. One, uh, what is the purpose of a roll call vote? What is the mentality behind it versus just a regular vote? And I don't know if you could answer that or, or the town manager. It could be it's to establish accountability for votes. It makes it clear on the record who voted which way so that, you know, future elections or if a citizen comes in, you know, at any time wants to find out how someone voted, uh, it's there on the record. Okay, besides that, I, I just, I just want to know what, why the chairman is any more, uh, I, I just, I, it confuses me this whole issue as to what difference does it make who's going to vote how. I don't think anyone's going to change their vote based on how the other counselors are voting. And I don't think it should be looked on as breaking a tie vote. Uh, is this to say that if something's going to be a 3-3 vote and the chairman sees him saying he's, he's the almighty and he's, he or she is going to say, well, it's going to go my way or no way at all. I don't think it, it's a pressure item and I don't think if it's, I don't know, I'm just going to vote against it. I don't think it's even necessary. 
It's personal opinion. Other uh, discussion? Councilor McLaughlin. I think when we get into some very hotly debated issues, and this council doesn't, right now, hasn't seen a lot of those, the one that comes to my mind would be when the, a previous council was dealing with the issue of sewers. And it became a very dramatic situation, perhaps more so than it needed to be. And I think in that kind of instance, it's very appropriate for the person who has taken on the responsibility of the chairmanship to take on the responsibility of voting last. It can be a tiebreaker. This council doesn't have that a lot of times. We're quite fortunate that we don't have the, some of the dissension and the political games that happen in other communities. But I think it's, it would serve us very well to know that the person sitting in the chairman's seat is going to be the last person to vote in a roll call vote rather than based on what your last name is. If it's based on your last name and we do it in alphabetical order, one person would have the last vote and the potential tiebreaker for three years. So your, your point is that it would be more equitable in terms of that responsibility shared more often by more mm -hmm. members mm -hmm. over time. Other, uh, other discussion? No, I have no problem with it. We have a motion then. I'm ready, I'm ready to vote. We have a second. Uh, no further discussion. All those in favor? Vote is five. All those opposed, one. Vote is five to one. The motion carries. Item number 106, to consider re a request from the town manager to close non-essential services at 12 noon on December 24th, 1991, and take any necessary action. Mr. Chairman, I support the manager's request, and I move that we approve closing non-essential services at 12 noon on December 24th. I second. We have a motion and a second and a non-request for a public hearing. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? We have a 6-0 vote. One o'clock. At this time, without suspending the rules, are there any citizens who would like to discuss any items not on the agenda? Seeing none, I will close that portion of the agenda and ask for a motion for adjournment. We move to adjourn. Sorry, I withdraw my motion. Thank you. We have a point of clarification. Do we need to suspend the rules if I just ask for clarification of a previous vote? I think it's close enough that we won't have to suspend the On rules. The vote for the budget cut. Was it implied that we were abandoning the shore road? Um, <laughs> My understanding as the chairman was that that was implied in the vote. Okay, I just want to make sure the others who voted positively for that believe that was that's the implication. Does that need to be more than implied? Does that need to be? I, my impression was we had to do more than implied that somewhere. I, mean, I don't have any problem with putting it. Should that be reflected in the minutes specifically? Somewhere. I think so. I think we have to have that written. I would feel much more comfortable if that were written down to show that the, a vote was taken on that. So noted. I don't hear any objection to that. No objection. I will take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye, aye. Six zero vote. Thank you very much this evening and good evening. Merry Christmas to you all. Merry Christmas yes. to all.